Okay, welcome back everyone to a brand new episode or the first episode of 2021 of the Crypto Muay Thai podcast. I'm your host, Chris Brookins. I'm very, very excited today to be sitting down and talking with our special guest or our next guest, I should say, Lawrence Lim. He's one of the founders of Ramp DeFi. Uh, Ramp DeFi is one of the hotter um, tokens within this particular space, one of the projects within the DeFi space right now for a variety of reasons. But before we jump into all that, Lawrence, how are you doing? Very good, very good. Thank you, Chris, for having me here on Crypto Mai Tai. It's uh, really uh, excited to be here, and you know, would love, you know, would be lovely to share about Ramdefi with you and your audience today. Uh, I'm I'm very very happy to to have you on. Um, so before we start talking about Ramp, why don't you just give us a quick, you know, sixty to ninety second overview of who you are and sort of like how you found yourself in this wide world, like building Ramp within this space. For sure, yes. So, quick background about myself. Uh, since school, um, I've actually started in traditional finance, spent around four or five years in private banking and mergers and acquisitions. And then I took the leap, actually joined a tech startup in Singapore, which is an inventory software startup, um, which was eventually acquired by Intuit. Um, after I left uh, the startup, I actually came into crypto, and that was with my uh, first crypto company called IOST. IOST is a layer one project and I was with them since pre-testnet that was in 2018 and I was with them for over two years building the entire ecosystem for a layer one project. So from you know launching at mainnet to onboarding nodes into the ecosystem and you know getting lists on exchanges and stuff. So that was really a the basic of my you know the set of foundation of my crypto experience. Um, it's interesting, but I actually got into crypto of a, a botched investment in a small crypto startup. Um, so, <laughs> but it really set me down the whole path. Um, so I, I guess, you know, uh, the money wasted had resulted in something meaningful. Um, after, <laughs> after I left iOS T uh, in 2020, that was uh, early 2020, um, it was really to pursue my own project in DeFi, which is Ramp. Um, I think at that time, decentralized finance was kind of getting started. Um, you know, it was actually not so easy to navigate the space because, you know, people were still recovering from the winter. Um, but, you know, um, our group of our founders, Preservia, you know, we, we look at ideas, see how we can spot, find our niche within uh, the decentralized finance space. And that was how we end up together working on Ramp DeFi and what it is today. Okay, gotcha. And uh, it's, it's interesting. It's always interesting to hear founder stories, because like, there's always some like weaving interconnectedness <laughs> to where it's like, oh, you know, I was just dabbling this or I made an investment or, you know, and then I just kind of went down this particular rabbit hole. It's like once you're there, you just dive deeper and deeper and deeper, um, which is really, really cool. So with with that being said, uh, tell us what ramp DeFi is. Um, you know, at a very high level, and then we'll just gradually peel back the layers of the onion from there. Of course, yeah. So what Ramp DeFi do is actually what we realized, and especially I was with a layer one project as well, is that over the last two to three years, with the rise of alternative layer ones, you know, different blockchain networks outside of Ethereum, that a lot of capital has been invested in this, you know, different ecosystems. So, you know, uh, I think, uh, all this investment has actually resulted in having billions of dollars being, uh, you know, in the ecosystem different from, different from Ethereum and also there's a lot of capital being held in staking. So as of today, the global staking market cap, you know, proof of stake blockchains that's also of Ethereum is, amounts to, I think, you know, 120 billion in terms of market cap. So what we realize is that uh, there's a lot of capital there, um, but staking itself, um, as an activity, uh, you know, typically use around five to ten percent on an asset that also has certain price risk. So, you know, um, the such a such a I would say um, capital efficiency for users is not ideal. It's not optimized because it's very vanilla. And what we want to do is to help users get higher capital efficiency with this um, state capital. So, what we do is to allow users to put it through RAM smart contracts on the various networks. And we are able to help them collateralize this smart contracts, uh, so it's collateralize these assets into a stable coin, which can then be bridged over to Ethereum 
And you know, right from there, they can use a stable coin to participate in DeFi protocols, or they will be able to exchange for USDT and USDC, you know, which allows them to still own the underlying portfolio, earn staking rewards, and still get liquid capital at the same time. Got you, got you. Yeah, that was, I mean, so we've obviously had a conversation before, but I'll just reiterate <laughs> reiterate it for you know for the for the listeners. Um, that's always been something uh, that I was seeing more and more as this sort of like disparate link that needed to be built um, for all the reasons that you just sort of talked about right there. With so much capital being locked up, where you're still providing the benefit of rewards, and then at the same exact time, the blockchain still gets all the security benefits. Um, and participation that goes along with the stakers there, but still being able to provide them liquidity um, to enter the Ethereum ecosystem, which became even hotter and even more in demand in 2020 for the massive boom that we saw in DeFi and uh, essentially all the yield plays um, that came in, whether it's liquidity pools, liquidity mining, yield farming, uh, whatever it have you, uh, that like that burst made this sort of solution that your guys building that much more paramount, um, it seemed in 2020. Yes, correct. So I think um, the speed at how quickly DeFi has risen, especially on Ethereum, um, I think it creates an interesting capital allocation decision, which is that you know if you are invested in uh, an asset that is using say maybe five to ten percent on an alternative network, and then on Ethereum you are looking at people participating in DeFi protocols that's yielding maybe you know, 20 30 percent, then you may feel tempted to actually be exiting certain positions, um, you know, bring your money into somewhere else and stuff, you know, leading to say capital drains from certain places. So what we want to do is really just let users have their cake and eat it at the same time, you know, keep your original portfolio. You don't have to be in a hurry to exit. Um, at the same time, you know, here's, uh, we have you collateralize your value, bring it into Ethereum. You can join all the action that's happening. Um, I mean, DeFi, there's so much action, right? Um, so, you know, we give them that chance to be participating without having to, uh, you know, be making early exits on any of their portfolio. And I think really Ethereum itself has, we have that little bit of a love-hate relationship, right? Because DeFi is so exciting. There's so many things happening. There's so many opportunities, yet gas fees are so high because of all this action. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like, uh, you know, we, we love what's happening, but um, there has to be maybe, you know, um, better ways, better ways for people to be participating without all of these fees being incurred. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's talk about that quickly and then we'll circle back to more of um, like the technical nuts and bolts of, of how you guys build the solution that we're talking about. Um, so what's your, like, what's your vision, you know, for that? Do you think, do you think ETH 2.0, uh, is something that can get up and running quickly enough? So I guess, you know, in my mind, there's, there's three, there's three layers here, or there's three potential forks or roadmaps that can go. So, you know, you just hold your nose and wait for ETH 2.0 because you've got confidence in the team, regardless if you think there's going to be delays, inevitable delays on that particular roadmap. Or you look for a side chain where, you know, a, pro, a, a protocol like Perp Finance is, you know, has built on XDI to be able to remove a lot of the gas fees and make what they're building um, in terms of decentralized derivatives exchange uh, that much more economical for the users. Or three, you start looking to some of these adjacent protocols that yeah. you know have better fees, uh, faster execution speeds, blah, 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 all that stuff that we all know about that we've been seeing in the white papers or light papers for the past two years, um, but also have some interesting projects being built upon them as well. So, you know, for for example, like Cosmos. So there's some really interesting projects being built on, you know, the Cosmos SDK, which I'm really, really uh, curious to see that sort of evolve over the coming years. So how do you kind of look at that for your particular, you know, protocol that you guys are building and where it ultimately goes? Because it has a meaningful effect, it has had, and will continue to have a meaningful effect on you know the protocol growth and the amount of users and TVL that you guys can attract. Right, correct. No, I think you are spot on. Right um, now, this is space is a strange space. Um, Ethereum two point zero probably wouldn't be out so soon. So uh, you know, I think your guest fees are here to stay for a while, and I think uh, 
I, I think maybe this is what well, actually I see as an opportunity, right? For all these other um, other ecosystems to actually, well, Ethereum is still making this transition to be able to, uh, you know, quickly scale up, ramp up, you know, their own ecosystems to be more competitive and you know, start to be able to draw people away into their protocols with, um, by developing, launching new innovative products, or even like uh, cloning some of the existing products because, you know, underpinning the whole DeFi ecosystem, there's certain things like lending and borrowing that doesn't go away. So I, I think there's all these opportunities and I, uh, especially say, for example, um, you know, Binance Chain, um, they see that the gas fees were ex especially um, high on Ethereum. They create something that can be linked through MetaMask. It's easy because lots of people have MetaMask and then they can go over to Binance Chain and use, say, you know, certain swaps, um, access assets easily without the same fees that you find on Ethereum. So, you know, all these alternatives actually is developing um, alternative solutions and options for users. And I think uh, if um, really, I think uh, other ecosystems are a bit more aggressive towards pursuing this sort of growth, then you know, potentially, you know, we might be able to see users start to shift towards all these um, different uh, ecosystems because the opportunities are there. So I think for us, especially for rent, because what we do is really collateralize liquidity that's still how it's taking. Um, we kind of try to pick an agnostic play to it. Essentially, um, what does people, what does users who create this liquidity really want? They want to really just deploy into a protocol or to be able to exchange this for say USDT or USDC, where they can maybe take, take this uh, USDT or USDC to exchanges to do margin trading and stuff. So they have very specific goals when they use our protocol. So what, what we offer them is essentially very simple. If we are able to find products, opportunities for them on anywhere, right? Whether it's Ethereum, it's Binance Chain, is any other, you know, blockchains like Polkadot, Cosmos, we should be bridging them there and allowing this liquidity to be put to work. That's what we are offering to users. So if say, you know, Cosmos, um, there's like a trading protocols, for example, an injective protocol, um, they are building layer two leverage trading opportunities. If they are willing to take a stable coin uh, as like a, um, to be used for trading, then users will be able to go there and um, get higher efficiency on their capital. So, you know, um, by bridging it over, it does make sense as well. So, you know, we, we are really focused on getting users liquidity into the places where there's opportunities. Got you. That, that makes total sense. Do you envision something to where your users are kind of guiding you on where on like where you your next steps for for building out so you you know you laid out all the you're agnostic we can do cosmos or polka dot whatever it have you but do you have a sense given how young your protocol is right now as to like what your users are looking to do is it simply like okay i want to have liquidity so that i can just get a little bit more yield so maybe i'll just you know, lend a little bit, get an additional five to ten percent with not that much risk, or like you're sort of talking about with injective, like I want to speculate, or is it I want to participate in yield farming and liquidity mining, mm -hmm. which is pretty much, you know, the the bulk of of, of that happens yeah. on Ethereum. So it's like I'm willing to pay the high gas fees to be able to get access to some of these more unique projects. So do you envision a world where your customers are kind of telling you, or are you trying to like front run based upon what you're seeing within some of these adjacent chains or what is kind of like cropping up in these adjacent space, or do you just not care and just want to build sort of like uh, a super suite where it's just a la carte and you let them, you know, pick, uh, pick their poison. Yeah, good question. So I think uh, right now everything is moving very, very fast. So the bridge over to Ethereum, 100% has to be there. Um, I think uh, I, I would say, you know, at least in the near term, we do see this to be the preference for users because um, ultimately, you know, the ease of the accessibility to fiat backed stable coins, the ease of participating in DeFi protocols um, in the range of DeFi protocols is easily accessible on Ethereum. Um, at the same time, because uh, we are in touch with multiple uh, different partners who are also blockchain foundations. So, you know, we also get visibility into what they are trying to develop for their ecosystems in the DeFi side. So um, I think uh, what we do see is that eventually, likely, we'll have what we call like a bit of a, 
um, liquidity hubs, right, on specific um, uh, ecosystems that also, I would say, typically also have a fiat backed stable called like USDT available within the ecosystem because, uh, um, because this sets a good base for, it's one of the building blocks for DeFi. So, um, so yeah, uh, I think uh, if we do see the foundation developing a good opportunity, then it is something that we can actually actively recommend to our, um, to our users and say, look, you know, we are going to bridge this uh, over there. You can participate in this specific solution that can help to earn, you know, X percent yield. So it gives a very uh, um, defined objective to users. And, you know, I think um, when that sort of information is being shared out to the public, we also get feedback very quickly on whether that's something they like. So for us, it's also a process of iteration. Um, you know, at crypto, it moves really quickly. So we also have to remain nimble and agile as to where um, liquidity can be optimized to find the highest yield. Yes, yes, of course. It, it moves incredibly, incredibly quickly. <laughs> So in, in this sort of like line of logic or thinking as well, um, do you envision a path um, of like users for your like building out your solutions? What I mean by that is assuming right now, given how young your particular protocol is, you know, a lot of them are going to be quote unquote crypto or blockchain natives, probably typically individuals um, that, you know, like myself, see potential in the, yeah. you know, in the project in what you guys are building and want to participate early on knowing that this is still a very, very young project. Ultimately, you know, do you envision that it's still going to follow that particular, you know, classification of participants of stakeholders, so to speak, but it'll just like grow in sophistication, you know, in terms of size of dollar amount, but also, you know, uh, again, sophistication I sort of talked about, or do you think eventually this could be something to where like foundations, businesses, um, things like that can utilize that are already kind of floating around at this space, like whether it be at the periphery or not, um, to gain additional yield on their assets. Because like you mentioned, um, you know, yield sells. We're both from traditional finance and I wasn't necessarily sure that it was going to be the same um, in <laughs> digital assets, but it seems 100% that it's, um, you know, the same where yield sell. So do you, have you seen early indications like of that or do you guys, do you and your other founders kind of have like a grand vision um, as you continue to iterate, progress and grow? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think uh, this is, Fairly interesting. Um, actually, the question also turns into whether enterprises and businesses have the appetite to venture this deep into a very decentralized world where everything is driven by smart contracts, um, powered by code visible and stuff. Um, of course, I, I think the key is also that um, that's also is a high risk, high returns um, environment, and uh, you know that's DeFi hacks, right? Um, protocols getting hacked and everything. Um, it's just part of the teething issues um, of a very nascent industry where, you know, people are building things at record speed and launching it to the public. Um, so I think, you know, just, uh, so I think uh, maybe this would be driven more by the more sophisticated um, um, funds that is able to look at code, um, evaluate it from, you know, technological perspective, the risks, and be able to make this sort of calculated judgments into um, you know, most a lot of all this higher yield but higher risk sort of um, um, structures. <laughs> so, so, so yeah. Um, but I think uh, it's growing really fast, and I think uh, the key is that um, the the I, I think it's really a funnel where you know users would come in, um, start from the centralized exchanges as always. You know, trading uh, on centralized exchanges, the big cap big cap tokens, um, trading the uh, leverage trading, and then realizing that, you know, oh, that's MetaMask. And then how can you be participating in all these, you know, new projects, protocols that's coming up, and then eventually going in there, holding a different portfolio of coins and creating different structures that actually, you know, be able to maximize leverage on their capital to achieve, um, you know, uh, uh, a better financial outcome. So, so I, I think there is a progression of this sort of sophistication for users, and um, 
and yeah, you know, I, I think uh, it's really uh, just starting. So we probably will see uh, like, you know, uh, an inflow of these users coming in across say 2021, 22. <laughs> um, that would be very, very exciting. So <laughs> let's, let's circle back to some of um, the yeah. tech nuts and bolts of what you guys are building. So at the beginning you gave sort of like the 20,000 overview as to what you guys yeah. are building. So again, kind of walk us through, um, the layers. We don't need to go super, you know, super in depth just in case. Like obviously you guys have tons of resources on your website um, as well, which I'll post a link to this whenever I put out the video. So kind of walk us through, you know, how you guys have built this quote unquote ecosystem, you know, from from top to bottom. And then maybe just touch on some parts that kind of makes it um, unique uh, with that kind of design structure that you guys have uh, have implemented. Of course, for sure. I think uh, that's the that's the key kind of like a differentiator that um, Ram is providing to crypto users. Essentially, what we do is that on all the different networks, we create a smart contract layer that the users can put their assets into, and the smart contract layer would assist the user to delegate it into the native staking program. Therefore, um, these assets become you generating. At the same time. What REM does is to issue a rep version of the token, which represents the ownership. So for example, for example, um, let's use dot, for example, uh, we'll issue a, a W dot, it's a rep dot. And it, by having rep dot, it means that the user has ownership of this token. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, he will be continually receiving um, staking rewards from the underlying staking program. And then he can collateralize this W dot into a stable coin. So the usual way, um, as with the usual way, you know, is over collateralization. So, you know, for example, 300%, you have $10,000, you collateralize out $3,000 um, in a stable coin um, value. And we think that this stable coin value is very key because um, when you have different networks and different assets, there's different value. Then um, you have, you know, if you're just playing around with the red asset. You you actually have to create liquidity for a range of different um, assets. You know, which becomes quite challenging. But by turning it into a stable coin, you actually give this portfolio a very defined dollar value, and that can let people um, make the exchange of value much more easily. So that's why you know we we came out with the stable coin concept. Um, by collateralizing this rep token representation to a stable coin, and then you bridge it over to Ethereum. This stable coin is now moving and native within the Ethereum ecosystem. And you know, we see a new wave of liquidity from all these different networks, you know, coming into Ethereum and um, you know, being able to act as like a, essentially a DeFi stable coin that you can invest into um, DeFi protocols, um, you know, for you farming, et cetera, or it can even be exchanged for USDT or USDC, uh, you know, through like liquidity pools, um, curve pools, for example, you know, set up a permissionless curve pool and um, have this be exchangeable with USDT and USDC. Um, so now users, you know, just start from point A, which is just staking, stick the assets. The user end up, can end up at point B where he or she is actually holding USDT or USDC. And this USDT and USDC can be deployed um, into say um, new opportunities. So, so, you know, without really, the, the whole thing is done without really them having to, um, inject new money from the bank. And they are also receiving staking rewards at the same time. So, um, that's the whole concept of ramp and the value proposition we are delivering to users. Got you. So kind of how, so let me ask you a question. Is your, is that, um, design schematic, uh, was that sort of dictated by you guys or the fact that um, this needed to be built on Ethereum or have the main bridge to Ethereum? So was that a, was that a de design choice by you guys or were you just working within the particular framework that you had to given you were trying to make sure that I was compatible with an ERC standard? Yeah, uh, I think uh, just for the simple fact that um, a lot of the DeFi action is happening on Ethereum. And of course, uh, actually a lot of networks already have existing bridges to Ethereum. So um, it's fairly kind of like, I would say just as a near term, be building towards Ethereum. 
Of course, um, as you know, more networks mature, then the possibilities become more myriad. But, um, but yeah, you know, uh, I, I think uh, that was the key for users to be deploying liquidity. They have to deploy into protocols that is you generating, and most of these protocols, um, or should, many of these protocols, are actually still found within the Ethereum network. No, totally. I was just curious just to see like if in the future, so let's like fast forward a year because this space moves so, so freaking quickly <laughs> um, that let's just say like Cosmos or Thorchain had leapt, you know, to the top and was able to suck a demonstrable amount of liquidity, um, you know, from Ethereum and, and other chains, if that would require you to sort of adjust uh, the design of the solution that you guys have sort of built, whether or not it would increase complexity or actually reduce complexity of that kind of design. So I was just kind of curious um, from from that perspective, like, you know, how it was built and if there's flexibility of one of these additional, um, you know, chain pairs sort of yeah. comes to the top. Yeah, actually, that's a good question. So uh, I think the key is that on the under um, various networks that we have developed the smart contracts layer on, um, it actually creates that token representation and that stable coin value. So if we say, you know, there's new networks, new protocols will be found somewhere else, then all we need to do is, you know, either build the bridge or have that bridge over and all this um, stake liquidity can actually be diverted towards the new ecosystem without actually, um, you know, too significant um, complex uh, development required. So I think um, that's kind of um, a fairly flexible, uh, I would say, um, technical direction that we have developed. Um, key thing is that, key thing is that I think uh, RAMP itself is really focused on a lightweight technical solution, you know, just smart contract layers, using existing infrastructure, bridges, um, you know, and stuff to just um, create a stake liquidity and just make it work. So, you know, we don't have a heavy infrastructure like a blockchain itself to really bring assets, transfer assets, you know, across different networks. So, so that allows us to be fairly uh, nimble. And if there's new networks that come out, uh, we'll be able to pivot over uh, with speed and with ease. Got you, got you, got you. What are the, um, what are the current uh, staking chains that are supported within RAMP ecosystem right now? Yeah, great question. So um, right now uh, we are we are supporting three networks. Um, first one is IOST, second one is Tomo Chain, and the third one is Tezos. And uh, we also have quite a number of our foundation partners in place, which we'll be continually integrating across the year, um, including Solana, Elrond, Nouns, and a few others. So uh, I think uh, this concept um, is fairly popular because especially for the foundations themselves, having uh, more capital and assets being staked within the network is always better for them. So, so yeah, uh, we do have you know quite a number of new partners unannounced as well. Um, I think this year is really about scaling up assets under management, um, as we call it. Um, we want we we also have recently announced a partnership with um, Metanix, which is UK based, and they are an existing validator for the Icon Foundation. So they will be also working with us um, to. Um, develop the smart contract layer on ICON. And uh, we will also be very soon pushing out a um, grant program for developers to come over and help us to develop on the various networks. Because you know our team, um, although we are multidisciplinary, we have the capabilities to be developing on multi-networks, it can't be done by you know a small team alone. So you know we are really engaging the power of the community, um, especially developers who can help us on all these various chains to develop that smart contract layer and help us to launch it um, within the various ecosystems so that it will be able to um, in a, uh, you know, scale up the amount of liquidity we can unlock from all of these different um, ecosystems. Got you, got you. Okay, uh, that's, that's, really, that's really interesting. So, I mean, I can imagine that there's a lot of chains that you know, see the solution and again, see the benefits for them as well from a foundational level to make sure that their assets, um, you know, the people that uh, with te like, I'll just use Tezos for, you know, as an example, to make sure that those individuals that maybe still believe in the long term vision have the ability to look for a little bit of yield elsewhere while not needing to sell their Tezos tokens, just given 
Um, you know, Tezos, it was doing great at the beginning of last year, but then kind of lost its shine, um, you know, vis-a-vis the comparison to Link um, at the end of the year. So I can see how that would be kind of a very unique proposition for some of these, uh, for some of these POS chains as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, maybe to put it in a nutshell, it helps um, users and investors be a little bit more patient on the network while it's still maturing and developing. Nice. Okay, I like I like that. No, I, it th- that actually makes sense too. And again, um, it's just the constantly like trying to find that niche where, um, like you said, where users, your stakeholders all around can have their cake and eat it. So the POS chains can still have the security, they can still have the active addresses, whatever it may be, for the most part, while still providing their users the ability to to get a little bit more yield, especially if the token maybe is a little bit stagnant, whether it's market conditions or just the shine is on another adjacent token at the current moment, um, while you guys are still able to um, taking that liquidity, un- unlock it, and then provide them an additional gateway um, to you know another opportunity, whether that's lending it out, yield farming, uh, derivatives, what it would have it. Um, one question: So, can you walk us through kind of like the fee structure? So, how um, does Ramp sort of how does the Ramp token accrue value from this? ecosystem of this solution that you guys have built. So kind of walk us, um, you know, through that. Great question. So I think uh, the RAM ecosystem, uh, the RAM token uh, focuses on a few things in terms of the utility, the core utility of the token. So firstly, the, uh, you know, the RAM is governance token. So um, eventually um, I would say probably towards the middle of this year, we expect that a community govern, governance to start um, really being t- implemented and users can actively start to raise proposals to decide the direction of the project as well as vote for these proposals and all this will require the RAM token. That's the first thing. Um, second thing would be that um, to onboard assets under management, we will be giving users um, uh, some RAM tokens as well. So, you know, uh, the first is you say, as an incentivization mechanism, but at the same time, um, of all these uh, POS chains, um, the smart contract also takes a percentage of the staking rewards. Um, the majority, 70%, is still returned to the user. Um, 30% is taken as uh, the fee for unlocking liquidity. Um, the key here is actually that we are taking from the staking rewards, which means that actually users do not experience any net loss as compared to say, you know, um, if you are entered into like a collateralized debt position, CDP or many protocols, you are actually paying interest. So you may actually come up with less assets than before. Um, what we do is that we guarantee that your principal will be there. Um, you share a part of your staking rewards as using this, uh, as using the protocol. At the same time, we reward you with RAM tokens to offset this fee. Um, once, you know, uh, we do have a plan that once uh, all this, um, I would say, um, you know, using RAM becomes a staple for people, then, you know, the rewards definitely, you know, at some point has to be reduced. Um, so uh, right now it's kind of like being balanced together. Um, but, you know, all these fees as a group will um, firstly be used to buy back RAM tokens and burn. Um, that's the first thing. Um, so it creates a deflationary um, mechanism. Um, and then uh, at some point where, you know, we have put enough tokens, um, all these fees can accrue to become um, distributions um, back to users who stick. Um, so I think uh, this is also a very key part of our mechanism. And then the third part is that, you know, during this period uh, where users wants to be participating in the RAM ecosystem being used to farm, um, holding RAM tokens actually increase the farming efficiency. So, you know, we want to let users who stick more who stick their RAM and stuff, you know, be able to get more RAM tokens because they have shown their um, shown their uh, willingness to participate and be a, a believer in the ecosystem that's being built at the moment. And uh, really, I think the fourth one, which is so fairly interesting, is that we are create we are letting them RAM be the collateral asset for the protocol. So the Stablecoin that's created essentially would be amalgating and combining 
um, assets from different places, you know, IOST, Tomo chain, Tezos, um, you know, all, all the other chains that will eat, all the other new tokens that will essentially be on and RAM token itself will also be one of the collateral assets. So, um, RAM, you know, users will be able to put their RAM into our staking program, still earn RAM and be able to collateralize their RAM into a stable coin that can be deployed into a DeFi protocol to earn extra yield. So, you know, giving the RAM users also this ability to stack their yield, which is, you know, the, the, the core, the core um, vision that we have wanted to do for, for everyone. Interesting. Interesting. I really, really, I really like that. And like, even though there's a bunch of different pieces sort of moving um, in the background, it all, it all makes sense. So like it all comes back to utility and value attribution um, to ramp. So I, I like it. Um, I, I apologize if I missed it. How are you guys, how's the financing of the buyback and burn? Um, how's that being financed? I apologize if I missed that. Oh, um, so this is finance because um, the staking rewards on all these chains. So, for example, um, uh, the staking rewards is ten percent on blockchain X. Um, so users would get by seventy percent of their staking rewards, which is still seven percent, and the remaining would be the fees would accrue to RAM token holders. Gotcha. So the system. So these fees would um, essentially be used to um, buy back RAM in the open market and burn the RAM. So are you using all 30% of the fees to, to buy back currently? Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. Do you, is, does that plan to like change? So obviously you guys mentioned that you're looking to implement governance by sometime mid mid year, which, you know, will change the entire dynamics of how decisions are made within this particular um, network. But at, at the current moment, given, you know, your particular team, uh, has primary say, is that what you're looking to, to con continue to do uh, until you get to that kind of like governance um, sort of launch pad at the midway point of this year? Yes, correct. So I think uh, just looking at it, um, we expect that our, we expect this to continue up until governance. Um, of course, um, I think the key about the community is that different, there's many people and everyone has their own ideas on how, you know, I guess fees generated can be used to support the ecosystem. So, um, you know, some wants to be burning, how much to burn. Um, RAMP itself is actually um, not mintable. So there's a fixed supply. And every time it burns, it will um, forever decrease in supply. So I, I think uh, it also can't be that you burn everything away. <laughs> if you do it for like, you know, across a long enough period of time, then RAMP probably will become zero. So I, I guess, you know, there has to be a point where people say, okay, you know, we'll maybe say you burn half the supply and then what's remaining, um, you know, as long as you stake tokens, the fees can be distributed to token holders who stake, you know, very similar to like, say, a, a white earn vault. So I think uh, there can be different ways to, um, um, you know, on how this can be used to accrue value to RAM token holders. And really, I think at that time, the community would be able will be able to have a voice and choose how they would really like to be rewarded for their participation. No, I, I think you guys are thinking about it um, logically with a lot of sort of best practices, so to speak, because I mean, the again, like anything in this particular space, it's constantly evolving and changing. So it's like the, the soup du jour of kind of how you want to reward your stakeholders or your token holders right now. You guys are firmly in that particular space, but you kind of have your your eyes around to how things could adjust, how they could change. Um, but also at the same exact time, um, giving a voice to your users as well, which I think is incredibly powerful, um, ultimately like in the long term for them to be able to decide. It's like, okay, does this make sense for them? Do they, is this how they want to be rewarded? Is this how they want to participate um, as well? Yes, correct. I think for us right now, um, we are keeping it a bit more centralized just for simplicity, um, being able to develop something that's fully working. And then, you know, subsequently, uh, after we, we have set up the systems where, you know, fees are generated, generated and everything, we are doing the burning, the community can then, you know, step in and say what we should be doing with this fees generated. But, um, you know, keeping it sort of um, centralized at the beginning allows us the ability to move faster and, you know, without having to, 
um, say, seek consensus from community governance, say, every week or something to implement anything new. Um, I think uh, that's where um, that's where there's a balance. That's where there's a balance. You know, being able to launch something quickly, um, keeping it centralized, and then slowly um, handing over various portions of it over to the community to govern. And um, so, so you know, I think uh, that's how we are developing the protocol going forward. Got you. Um, how many tokens are are outstanding? Or, or you know what? Walk yeah. quickly, sort of like walk <laughs> me through um, your 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 token distribution structure. Uh, I, I realize this, this is a very nuanced subject, but I figured it's just worth to just like talk about very quickly from a high level, just for the people um, that are listening to go beyond sort of like the technological solution that you guys are building, which is obviously quite unique and needed in this space. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, Rev itself has minted their 1 billion tokens. So um, around uh, close to 20% was being used for the private sale and the public sale. And um, the uh, team retained 16%, which is uh, vested across a period of three years. Um, the remaining, another remaining 20% of the protocol reserves, which is used for, um, I would say, more event-driven uh, um, Utility, say for example, exchange listings or um, you know setting up part of this grant program in RAM tokens, um, marketing um, collaborations, partnerships, etc. So um, so yeah, um, there's a protocol reserves, and the remaining forty five percent is really farming reserves. So you know it's pretty high percentage, and this farming reserves is really here to reward um, say RAM holders who are participating with us in a variety of functions, whether it is just you know sticking in our vaults um, or collateralizing the ramp or being liquidity providers for ramp um, so all of these you know um, users who are actively participating with us uh, will be receiving uh, you know rewards from this farming reserves so um, quite a big percentage uh, that has been taught by the community about potentially just you know removing part of the supply um, of course um, again down to community governance but um, as of right now, um, it does give us the kind of um, um, token reserves to be actually powering a, a lot of um, participation and inside this program that can help to scale up the size and, um, and the size of the RAM ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was, I, I just thought it was worth mentioning because it's such a crucial component. And tokenomics is one of these very, very unique things. Like in particular, whenever you're, at the size that you guys are trying to incentivize bootstrap participation within this um, sort of burgeoning network, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't say an abundance, but um, you know, a good size of tokens that isn't necessarily a negative thing because you need that to be able to distribute out to your community and have engagement participation. And then everyone, hopefully that makes people want to go deeper, whether that's attracting additional, additional people via word of mouth or even from themselves saying, you know what, like, I, I actually love this. I think this is going to be big and I want to, you know, I want to participate even more, have an even greater voice uh, potentially in the governance. But, but what's unique is the, the it quickly becomes diminishing returns uh, of marginal utility for like that amount whenever you, and, and it's constantly like you sort of talked about that iterative process to where you're trying to find whenever, you know, the benefits start going like, like that from, from your token, uh, from your token supply. So, um, yeah, I, I figured that was just a, a worth while topic to sort of discuss. One question right. that I had given you mentioned that, um, did you have anything else to put on that? I'm sorry. I, I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you to cut you off. If you had anything else that you wanted to add to that. Nah, I think you got it. You got it spot on. So, like your incentives itself is fairly. Um, it's there's a sweet spot to incentives. So, um, when we do token emissions, we typically you know run quite a few models just to see like our, what's the scenarios that's happening, and um, we also make our emission programs, rewards programs, um, term based in nature. So, um, typically it would be like for three months. Um, you know, at least we'll be able to see how it's working out, how the community is responding to it. Um, are emissions too high, too low? Um, so I, I think uh, just, you know, even like this, it gives us that space to be 
um, kind of adjusting towards something that um, can be optimized um, rather than, you know, there's quite a few say DeFi protocols um, that would just go like, um, we are just going to emit this amount per block over the next, um, you know, half a year, one year sort of period. And, and it, it creates that a bit of um, inflexibility in how things are, you know, when, when, when things change, you know, emission rates doesn't change, when the ecosystem, the ecosystem change, the community change, the emission rate still doesn't change. So, um, of course, you know, um, the trade-off is really actually also um, transparency and decentralization because, uh, you know, when you do that per block, then it's very visible, right? Everyone knows how it works, but um, that's why, you know, actually, again, coming back to the same centralized, decentralized portion, um, as a centralized kind of like a, a way of developing the ecosystem, the network, um, by being able to deploy uh, the farming reserves into you know more optimized programs under optimized metrics and making changes along the way if we have to put in certain investing schedules um you know change how things work um it gives us that flexibility and allows us to get more mileage out of these reserves no 100 percent. i mean I, i'm a i'm a data individual i'm a data person by heart so having more data um to make decisions upon with fact versus opinion is always going to be preferable um, to me and in, 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 in all frames and facets. So I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, as I was mentioning, I had one question. So you, you talked about how ramp can actually be used as collateral um, within the ecosystem. Do you have plans to build, um, I guess, bolt on uh, products in the future? Um, or is it kind of like too early? Obviously, you want to focus on on nailing this beachhead, like this killer app, so to speak, and then sort of evolve from there. But I, I just figured it was curious just to see whether you guys have had any like very, very early level conversations um, in regards to that. Because I mean, if, if it's used a collateral, you can you can mint your own um, stable coin then in theory, you might be able to build your, you know, an additional sort of like bolt on um, DeFi solution that can be housed within, you know, the ramp ecosystem. It doesn't necessarily need to plug in to, I don't know, you, you know, somewhere out like a compound or Ave or whatever to maybe get some, some interest. It can just simply go there, which in turn provides more fees that you can take from and then ultimately attribute back uh, to the community, whether it's foundation burn, um, you know, to the token holders. So I just wasn't sure if you had given any initial thought to something like that. For sure, actually, that is what we are looking to do as well. So I think the key for us here is that, um, you know, now that we are developing a stable coin, and I think, um, I think stable coin perceptions have also came far during 2020, um, you know, from the beginning where USDT and USDC are the staple, um, DAI itself, you know, um, is there has been around for quite a while, but um, I think with the rise of a lot of DeFi protocols, um, I think we can see it shift, you know, like DAI become substantially accepted within the um, DeFi space, new stable coins start to become substantially accepted, and then even now, like um, stable coins like uh, um, the, the algorithmic stable coins I, I even accepted on, you know, DeFi protocols. So, so the acceptance level for users have actually came quite a long way. So essentially, uh, we are looking to have the stable coin that we create called IUSD to be used um, within, say, other DeFi protocols. And we have been making partnerships to make that happen. So once that's done, it means that um, users holding IUSD can actually, within DeFi itself, be deploying it to get extra yield. And you know, at the underlying, you know, starting from say whether it's um, staked RAM or um, staked IOSD, staked Tezos, um, they are earning from the native rewards program. At the same time, when they collateralize into RUSD, they can take this RUSD and deploy for extra yield. So they are able to stack up yield from the same based assets or capital. Um, and then, uh, of course, the uh, the second part would be also creating mechanisms like your. Uh, um, liquidity pools where users from IUSD can actually also exchange into USDT or USDC, which you know can be used for trading or exchanges and stuff. So it creates that flexibility for this stable coin to be used within the ecosystem. So um, yeah, so I, I think uh, this is really the key for us um, in terms of making sure that you know RUSD has that sort of acceptance and is actually useful because. Uh, 
That way users would want to use RUSD and therefore users would want to use RAMP. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I agree. There's, there's so many different like paths and, and ways that this can go by. My, you just, you kind of caught me whenever my, my gears were, my gears were turning there. I'm like, okay, if it goes through here <laughs> and then it starts to, so, <laughs> so um, no, I, I think this is, this is incredibly interesting. Um, I mean, I've been talking to you guys for, you know, before this even launched. So I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of what you guys are building um, for a variety of reasons, but I think uh, this is going to serve a pretty critical uh, function within DeFi. Like the next phase within DeFi, just in my opinion, is like the the interchangeable phase. So like 2020 was the year of ERC based tokens having their day in the shine, but also with these new mechanisms, a bunch of yield, blah blah blah, all this other stuff. You know, I think the next stage is having that interchain operability and being able to pick from the best of these different chains world where it doesn't necessarily need to be um, specifically on Ethereum, which can potentially um, not just open up the variety of assets that you're looking at, but also um, some of the additional benefits that you might be able to receive on, on some of these chains um, as well. So I'm a huge proponent of what you guys are building. Before we, you know, sort of wrap up for the call, is there anything that uh, we didn't get a chance to discuss or, or talk about today that you want to make sure that you kind of put out there um, to the ecosystem before you go? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I think, uh, to be fair, I think, you know, we really covered a lot today, uh, especially around you know, the solution. Uh, even the technicalities of doing it. Um, so um, I think uh, as with everything, maybe the best way to end up is to kind of distill everything into uh, a concept that's simple, right? And I think, you know, that's helped users to remember. Um, I, I think uh, just kind of like a, a quick summary would just be like, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, liquidity that's actually locked up in staking. And what RAM is going to do is that we help users to unlock this liquidity, turn into a stable coin where they can find additional yield and they'll be able to stack different sort of use together, you know, the staking rewards, um, the yield from RUSD stable coin, and, you know, by deploying into various different DeFi protocols. So, you know, hopefully this way it gives users um, the ability to uh, get higher capital efficiency. Um, I think, uh, you know, just um, kind of ending this off and of course, um, um, you know, we, we do have a, a lot of our community and public channels where we actively engage with our community. Um, I also do like a weekly AMA with our community every week, every Wednesday um, is one of the ways where, you know, we let our, our community know that we are visible, we engage with them, help them to understand the roadmap, the solution we are building, and uh, that can be done in our, following our Telegram channel. <laughs> So I'll make sure that I include all the links um, to everything that you're talking about uh, whenever I release the the podcast. So I'll put the Telegram channel in there. Are you are you guys on Discord too, right? Yeah, we do have a Discord channel. Okay, yes. so Telegram, Discord. Um, obviously, I'll put your site and stuff like that. But if there's anything else that you want me to throw on, don't hesitate to, to send it over to me. Um, and I'll make sure that I include that um, for the for the users as well. But Lawrence, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I think we did the perfect balance, if I say so, you know, if I say so myself, of being able to like go up at the 20,000 and dive a little bit and then go up and then dive a little bit as well to be able to give the listeners and the viewers um, a pretty good representation as to like what you guys are building, why I think it's um, significant within this particular space and hopefully be able to see it kind of progress um, in the future just given everything that we you know, that we sort of talked about on the call today. 100%. And thank you so much for having me here today on the uh, Crypto Meta podcast. Uh, you know, we have been chatting since, you know, quite a few months back. And uh, finally, being able to come on here is uh, really exciting. Um, you know, thank you for being here. And uh, no, th thank you for having me here. And uh, really, you know, all the, you know, everyone who's been watching, listening to us, sharing that, you know, hopefully it's a valuable session um, for everyone.
Got you. I can't wait to have you back on in a couple of months whenever you guys have knocked out even more milestones and hopefully you guys are, are moving even faster. But, uh, but until then, uh, we'll see you next time, guys.